Hi, Nick Rains here from Leica Academy Australia. I'd like to share with you how I shoot with the Leica SL2 and also show you some of the images I've taken with this camera right here. If there was ever a single camera that could do everything, then I reckon the SL2 would be close. There's virtually nothing it can't tackle and it does it with great ease. The controls are amazingly intuitive and overall it's just a, well, a very successful camera. It's a camera that gets out of the way as quick as possible and doesn't impose its own idiosyncrasies on what I actually want to achieve as a photographer. Now, why would I say that? It's just a camera at the end of the day. I mean, how different can they be? Well, there's a couple of things about the SL2 which are worth pointing out. First of all, Leica's whole design philosophy is about simplicity and you simply don't have very many buttons and controls on most of the modern Leica cameras, particularly the SL2. There's one, two, three on the back, uh, there's a dial, a dial, a joystick and a little custom a rocker custom button here and of course a shutter, a shutter release. Oh, and two more here but none of them have got labels with the exception of the on off button and the three on the back these are all customizable so you don't need to use them if you don't want to but if you do want to use them you can make them do whatever you want to do so you have the option of setting up the camera to work for you rather than having so many buttons and not knowing what to do with them it, it, it sounds like it's missing things but in actual fact more less is more let's get that correct less is definitely more and when you reach a certain point of your career in photography or a certain level of experience you realize that an enormous number of features that are put onto modern cameras are how can i put this just not that useful as long as you understand your shutter speeds your apertures and your isos as long as you can focus the camera and as long as you can get a good responsive uh, shot as in good you know responsive shutter shutter button mangling that a little bit you get a you know really quick responsive shutter button and so you can time the picture then you're going to be successful it's not about this mode or that mode or whatever or whether you're shooting manual or aperture priority or some other mode it's about how does the camera respond to your use how does it get out of the way and how does it actually just not get between you and your picture and this if you think about it if you have too many decisions to make at the time of shooting, like which mode or which button to press, it's going to interfere with your creativity. What you want is a camera that doesn't impose itself on you. And that's what I mean by a camera that gets out of the, ray, the way really quickly. And this camera does that. There's a couple of aspects I want to point out. The, the 47 megapixel thing is just amazing. Uh, I don't need to really tell, you know, talk about that very much, except I can do really amazing big prints out of it. 47 megapixels is just more than 24 or 10 or whatever. So it's just a good thing. It doesn't seem to slow the camera down. It'll still shoot 20 frames a second. I mean, yeah, seriously, 20 frames a second. But more importantly, it's the handling. The, the, the focusing has a, a, an odd hybrid autofocus mode. And when I say odd, it, it's not obvious why you would set the camera in manual focus, but actually get autofocus. And the way that works is if you set the camera in manual focus, yes, you can focus here. But what you can also do is a joystick on the back of the camera. And if you click on it, it turns on autofocus so that it will focus on whatever you have the, uh, the little square pointing at. And as soon as you release your finger, it's not focusing anymore. So it's like an active autofocus, even though the camera's in manual focus. You have to kind of get your hands on one and try it, but it's the most elegant autofocus system I've ever seen on any camera. Works for me beautifully. My my hit rate of sharp pictures and sharp where I want them to be sharp has gone up dramatically since I moved to the SL and now the SL2. Okay, um, other than that, oh yes, of course, big change from the SL. That's the in-camera image stabilizer. And that is a big deal. And I've got a few images I'll show you in a minute, which show that off to its maximum effect. Um, I was dying to get my hands on the first Leica that has in-body uh, image stabilization, and I was not disappointed. It works down to an amazingly low shutter speed, as long as you're careful. Now, just to give you a little hint on that one, if you are using this camera and you do want to shoot at a very, very low shutter speed, be very, very careful that when you gently squeeze that shutter button, you don't release it immediately because if you're trying to get a half a second exposure you and you actually lift your finger 
you'll be moving your finger within that half a second. So the trick, and if you, if you really want to push this camera as far as possible, is to hold your finger, take that first pressure up, release the shutter, and then don't take your finger off until you hear that second click as the shutter closes again. That's really important. And then if you're very careful and you hold yourself really still, I've been able to shoot one second exposures with a 90 millimeter lens. Now that's amazing. But this is not a camera review. This is me talking about the pictures that I shot, shot with the camera and also showing you the images that I've shot. So let's flick over to some of the images that I've been shooting recently. And this is not the world's best photograph. It's not the world's most exciting picture. It was taken whilst I was uh, doing some Lycra Academy, Academy work in Sydney. It's a view from my hotel room. But I'd only had the camera briefly and I thought, well, it's got a stabilizer. Let's see how far we can go. This is a 90 millimeter shot taken at one second exposure, handheld across the balcony, and it's sharp. This one is the same. These are both taken at one second handheld. Now, I did it carefully, absolutely. You can't just wave the camera around and hope to get sharp images. But these are tack sharp at 90 millimeters for a one second exposure. So rather than having to shoot at a high ISO, so I get a 125th or a 60th of a second with this 90 millimeter lens, I was able to shoot these at, at um, ISO 100, very, very carefully shoot them, but get a one second exposure and still have a sharp image, which is quite astonishing. And I was in Sydney actually to work with one of my uh, colleagues from America, Craig Semetko, and he had not seen the camera before either, it all being a bit secret at the time. So we did some portraits of each other. And this is a half a second exposure at, with the 90 mil Simicron at F2. So again, low ISO. This was in the hotel room in semi, not semi darkness, but subdued light, shall we say. So half a second. Now he had to hand, he had to hold fairly still. And I wouldn't normally do that, but it was interesting just to see how far we could push it. I took the camera to Antarctica recently as well, um, and this is where a camera like this really shows its metal, because when you're working out of a zodiac and things are happening really quickly, and believe me, whales do not hang around and they pop up where you're least expecting them. You need a camera that can be wielded as easily as possible and get the highest percentage of sharp images and in-focus pictures as possible. And the SL2 did not disappoint me. Um, I also was working with a BBC film crew whilst I was there and working in the confines of a Zodiac, and there's actually six of us on board. You really don't get a chance to change your, your point of view or move around, and you just have to take things as they happen. The last thing you want to be doing is saying to the main cameraman, uh, can you just do that again, please, because I missed it. So having a very fast responsive and efficient camera is absolutely crucial when you're taking serious images like this. It's also excellent on a tripod, of course. Uh, I shot this with a neutral density filter to make that water go all smooth. Uh, I didn't need the stabilizer in this case because I, um, I, and I, in fact, you should really turn it off if you're working on a tripod because there are situations where the stabilizer is looking for movement that's not there and the sensor can actually move during the exposure. So a good technique is to turn the stabilizer off when you're on a tripod. Uh, black and white works just as well. It's got a really good dynamic range. This is quite a contrasty image, and I, I think you'll agree that it brings out the uh, textures of the iceberg really amazingly well. I uh, yeah, do a lot of conversions to black and white. It's one of my favorite genres, although I don't shoot much black and white commercially, as you can see from these pictures on the wall behind me here. If I just cut back. Those. They're all in colour and those are the ones that uh, usually are the ones that I sell the most of. Oops, got past one. There we go. Again, another black and white image. This is more personal work. I have a thing about clouds. If anyone's ever been to any of my academy workshops, they've probably heard me go on about uh, how I'm a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society, which is a real thing. You can you can look it up. And I do love interesting textures in skies and interesting clouds and interesting light, particularly when the sun is behind clouds and you get that reflection on the water. It's just a beautiful thing. Of course, the SL2 works with a whole range of lenses. This is shot on the 90 to 280 uh, at the 280 end, and it's really effective for isolating wildlife in the background. I've also got down low with this camera because I don't like that looking down uh, angle of view on animals. I much prefer an eye level shot. So as a little wildlife tip, if you can get to animal level, you'll find that you have a, a better shot. And also you can separate the animal out from a more interesting background. 
Close-up details, 90 to 280 again. I've got this as a print on the wall behind me. Um, just close-up of a king penguin's chest with that amazing yellow. Uh, very effective for the autofocus. You really don't want mucking around. And this bird's actually moving towards me because uh, king penguins don't hang around that much when they're really close to you. They tend to waddle close, have a look at you, and then waddle off. And you have to be really quick. So the autofocus was constantly working here, trying to pick up detail in that uh, those feathers and it achieved a very high hit rate. It's not too bad for tracking either. Um, this is a uh, petrel. I'm not really good at birds. You'd have, if, if I'm wrong, forgive me. Um, I did shoot a lot of stuff off the back of the ship. Um, bird photography has a relatively low hit rate. Uh, I managed to get a, a satisfactory number of sharp pictures uh, using the tracking feature on the SL2. Wasn't something I'd done before. So I was a little bit unaware of the subtleties of it. But once I'd got the hang of the settings, I found that it gave me a very consistent result with that 90 to 280. It's another one of an albatross coming straight towards me, which of course is quite tricky for any camera to do. The other interesting thing is the exposure on both of these was pretty good. And considering they're quite backlit, that's, that's impressive. Not Antarctica. Clearly, this is Myanmar. I, I took a group of Leica Academy students to uh, Myanmar just before Christmas and uh, we did visit uh, the places like Inlay Lake here and a few other places. So I'll show you a few of those pictures. The, there's a slight quirk with this picture which you may or may not be able to see in, on the screen, but the background is a lot more out of focus than you'd expect um, for a subject which is uh, probably 50 metres from the, uh, the camera. Normally you'd expect it to be a lot sharper. I actually shot this with the 90mm Simicron as a, as a series of stitched images. So it's shot as a panorama. So each shot only takes part of the boat. And because of that, I can get that 90mm f2 depth of field. But I've got the angle of view of probably a 28 or 35mm lens. So it's a little technique I've been working on for a while. And there's another picture coming up which illustrates it even better. Um, I'm using the 8, now this is the 35mm Summilux for the CL here. I wanted a fast aperture lens to take with me and I didn't have the SL 50mm Summilux. So I used the 35mm CL Summilux instead. So I'm sacrificing some resolution because it comes back to about 20 megapixels, but I'm still getting the beautiful fall off at f1.4. Uh, this was shot inside a temple, again handheld at a quarter of a second, f1.4. Normally I would have had to get the tripod out, and in fact, you've got to be a bit careful not to get lazy with this camera because you can think, oh, I can get this shot, it's actually no problem at all. I can use a stabilizer, but you know, just be careful because a stabilizer isn't, uh, doesn't cover 100% of circumstances. Again, working quickly, this lady is painting this uh, huge parasol, but she's working really fast. The brush is flicking around quite quickly, so you really don't want to be hanging around. So having a camera which can focus, expose, and capture the shot as quickly as possible is ideal. Low light again. This is a handheld shot using, I believe, that 35mm Simulux CL lens again. There's a couple of uh, children lighting candles in this temple in uh, Inlay Lake, or near Inlay Lake. And it was just one of those things you come across by sheer luck. So you don't want a camera which is going to let the side down here. So even the autofocus can struggle in these very, very dark situations. But the, uh, the SL2 came through very, very well here. More fishermen on Inlay Lake. Uh, I've got to confess, I did set this one up. I, I did get them to sit in the end of their boats there and have a quiet cigarette. And, uh, but I was looking for this very specific pattern in the water. Um, the, the, the lake was fairly calm. And I love the way that their orange suits uh, reflect in the water. This is shot on the uh, 90mm Summicron on the SL2. And my goodness, that's a good lens. It just, ah, uh, it's just so crisp. Has a lovely fall off in the background and it is very accurate on the autofocus. So it gives me a lovely perspective. This is where the stabilizer comes into play. Going inside a, uh, it's, um, Lotus flowers can be woven, or it's the sap from woven lotus flowers, or to be more accurate, the sap from the stems of lotus flowers can be woven into fabric. And this is where they were dyeing that fabric. It's a very, very dark room with no light except for what comes through the windows. So I shot this on the 24 to 90 handheld at about a quarter of a second, 
And if you look closely in the picture, if you looked at the original, you can see that there are parts of the steam that are actually blurry because the steam's moving quite quickly. And during that exposure, it's blurred. But the rest of the picture is sharp because of the stabilizer in the camera. It's a shot I would have had great difficulty getting without actually grabbing my camera, uh, my camera, grabbing my tripod or shooting at a much higher ISO, which of course gives you noise and is not quite as good an image. So that stabilizer works beautifully. Close-ups, same sort of thing, low light, stabilizer really picks up the sharpness of the picture beautifully. Here I'm just seeing how far I can go. I've, this is a middle of the day shot, zooming along Inlay Lake, but I've put a 10 stop neutral density filter on the camera and I've forced it to about a quarter of a second, maybe half a second exposure. I've stood up in the front of the boat and obviously photographed back, deliberately wanting that water whizzing past to leave those streaks and give that impression of speed. This is an impossible shot without an image stabilized camera because you couldn't really use a tripod in this circumstance. It would have been very difficult. It's very narrow and a bit wobbly. So the stabilizer was just perfect here. Same again, stabilizer shot. This is on the 35 mil Summicron for the SL2. Um, that's the moon, not the sun behind those clouds. And obviously the rest of it's candlelit. This is, I think, about 400 ISO f2 on the Summicron lens and about a quarter of a second exposure so very very dark and yet it's picked up all the detail from the shadows through to the highlights just beautifully same situation same temple shooting in candlelight quite literally this this now we're into high iso shots this is 1600 iso f2 but again i've got that stabilizer giving me a sharp uh, subject when the, the subject is static but that doesn't help you with subject movement because obviously subject movement is very much uh, affected by the shutter speed. And I had to time it so that this girl was just holding still, lighting a candle rather than moving her arm around. I think this is about a quarter of a second, maybe half a second. Uh, and I didn't get 100% sharp here because she kept moving. Uh, obviously I can't stand, ask her to stand still, it's a documentary shot, but still having the stabilizer and the very good high ISO capabilities of the camera worked in my favor. Same thing here. Uh, this is on the 18mm M lens on the SL2. So super, super wide, uh, shooting manual focus and letting the camera as autofocus, uh, autofocus, auto exposure do all the work. Uh, worked out pretty well, this one. Now, this is a shot that I wanted to make look like one of those Victorian pictures that you see. And they were, of course, shot on uh, large format cameras back in the 19th, uh, 19th century. So I've shot this with the 90mm Summicron as a series of overlapping images in three rows of five images. So I've got the depth of field of a 90mm lens, but I've got the angle of view of about a 50mm lens. And it's got that old Victorian sort of static look about it where people had to stand still for a second or two to have their photograph taken. Um, it was a little bit tricky to stitch together, but I think it came off quite well. And then the last picture is, this is one of those temples that sits right on top of a volcanic plug. And you can walk up to that. In fact, we had done earlier in the day. But this is a view from our hotel at the very, very beginning of dawn, I believe, so that the light is just picking up those golden spires. But everything else is in that, is, is that deep blue of the pre-dawn light. This is a tripod shot. Uh, on that 90mm Summicron again, and I thought it made a fitting final photograph. A very, very versatile camera. I, I just can't begin to tell you how effective this camera is a, as a work tool. It's not the smallest camera in the world, it's not pretending to be, but it's waterproof, or sorry, water resistant and dust resistant. Um, it's got astonishingly responsive autofocus. Um, it will shoot as quickly as you want. It's got 47 megapixels of capture, so you can do A1 prints out of it quite easily, or bigger. So really, there's virtually nothing that I could criticize in this camera, nothing at all. It gets the job done, and what else can you ask from a camera?